So, um, Josh, I'm going to switch it over sure. back to you sure. here. Okay. So, th thanks, Jonathan. I think the you know the ASHRAE 55 standard, and I think I think the kind of emerging uh, tools that you were describing, I, I think I think are something that we should all be um, be considering and 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 advancing and really. Um, you know, kind of refining the and about the evaluation of these bioclimatic strategies. Um, at the same time, we should continue to unpack this a little bit, just so so that um, you know we can make this uh, you know kind of accessible to to all projects. And and I think uh, we'd be remiss in the context of an of an AIA 2030 uh, commitment uh, group to not mention the 2030 palette. And the the you know. Just to kind of start, you know, begin at the beginning with bioclimatic design, real, you know, real quick here. Um, you know, you want to identify, you need to identify the, the bioclimatic strategies that are appropriate to your to your climate or microclimate in, so, in the case of uh, the top of uh, Pikes Peak. Um, not the the different bioclimatic strategies are not going to be applicable to, uh, to to different conditions so it's something you definitely want to that needs those questions need to be asked as we are evaluating bioclimatic design in the context of our our process you can go to the next slide john so um i, I mentioned the 2030 palette and you know this is uh, also accessible through the uh, the, the 2030 uh, actually the 2030 challenge the architecture 2030 challenge uh, website as well um, and you know it, it you know states it's a, re a resource for the design of zero carbon adaptable and resilient built environments worldwide it's also a, a great resource um, to share with this group uh, for bioclimatic and passive strategies and and it and it goes into you know you, you can see that the palette kind of behind here this is under the building tab it, it goes further into um, identifying strategies that are applicable to different climates. You know, the, you know when, when, when is natural ventilation um, a strategy that you want to be, that you should be considering? Um, it could be based on your siting, it could be based on your climate. Um, you know, same thing goes for shading and other, other uh, kind of climate responsive uh, uh, tech, uh, design strategies that are appropriate to those climates. And the and the palette goes a step you know a couple steps further, um, providing resources, um, in some cases uh, links to tools and other other websites. But this this 2030 palette itself is uh, you know I think a very good tool, um, and identifies a lot of the rules of thumb, and it even gives uh, some you know some real um, you know est you know mathematical estimates of, of what you can you know you can. Uh, seek to achieve with, uh, you know, with, with natural ventilation or other strategies. You know, tries to tries to identify some of those tangible benefits. And I think um, you know this this is a good time to uh, to lead into our second project. I think that that's our next slide. Yeah. So um, uh, the the project that we presented earlier, obviously, um, you know, the, the climate had such a, a, a form, formative presence in uh, in that that project. We also wanted wanted to make and, and as uh, as Pete said, it's, it's kind of a one in a one in a, once in a lifetime project. So we wanted to to kind of bring this back to um, a, a more familiar program and and to, and also potentially a, you know a, obviously a more familiar uh, climate to to us. So um, uh, Brad and David um, uh, uh, David's been at, at SMP for about twenty five years and. They've been working together for about uh, 20 years, I, I believe, and um, uh, SMP they've uh, worked together on a number of uh, AI Co 10, top 10 projects. Um, they are going to be presenting um, a new uh, STEM center that opened last fall um, at the Academy of, of uh, Notre, Notre Dame in uh, uh, or Notre Dame, I guess. Uh, in and, and David, I don't know where. Uh, where where what's where this is uh, actually outside of Philadelphia, but maybe if we could switch over to you, you can uh, introduce the project. Stop sharing here. Sorry, I realized I um didn't update the name on there. It is the Riley Cent the Riley Center for STEM Education at uh, Notre Dame Academy <laughs> in Radnor, PA. So um, Brad, David, 
Adi. Yeah, great. Um, Jonky, thank you very much. Josh, thank you for the intro. Uh, everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Great. So uh, Brad and I have been working for 20 uh, plus years on projects. Um, Brad, have we actually done a top 10 coat project together? I don't know. I, I know I've applied several times with you, but I don't know if we have. Okay. I, I didn't want to misrepresent any of our other engineers who might be watching out there. Um, but uh, we do definitely do work with Brad on a regular basis. Um, we love working with Brad because um, he really encourages architects to be architects. Uh, he participates in that, in that process sometimes, making um, design suggestions, but he really... Uh, he, he wants the project to do as much work as possible as far as heating and cooling the building. Um, and so uh, he likes us to make his job easier. So uh, just some quick stats on this project. Uh, it is in uh, Radnor, Pennsylvania, so Delaware County, uh, 30,000 square foot STEM classroom building. It was completed in 2019. Uh, the program is science lab classrooms, math classrooms, so traditional uh, 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 sort of low-tech uh, classrooms, uh, faculty offices. The offices are actually in this building, and it's part of the program uh, to have uh, faculty readily available with students. Um, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but a, a sort of core design concept here was the idea of collaborative corridors and an, an atrium that would be used as multifunction spaces. Uh, so for additional education, small group activities, at times special events um, outside of the classroom. Uh, the project has achieved LEAD, LEAD V4 silver certification. Um, I, I could probably go on much longer than you want me to for this group about the design of the project. Um, so if I get too far into those weeds, somebody please pull me out. But um, the overall con of the project was the idea of this contextual design um, that responds to both the central quad, apologize for the sirens, um, of the campus, uh, but also sort of putting a new identity on a somewhat traditional school uh, with this forward thinking design, um, looking into the future of STEM education. Um, we see it as a very successful project because we have a very happy client. Uh, as we said, Delaware County, just to acknowledge uh, the climate zone 4A, mixed humid. And Brad, please jump in here at any point. So a little background on the project. Uh, this is what we received um, when we were selected to do the project uh, from the school's existing master plan. Uh, I made reference to a new quad. And so this building is anchoring the end of the quad, a sloping site here that faces uh, uh, a sort of public street. Uh, but this for many years was seen as the back of the campus and the, this project was intended to put a new face on campus. So one of the first things that we did, uh, which we do in all of our projects is to explore options and uh, talk with the client about those options. Uh, I won't go into all of these, but essentially the things that we did, um, we refined the orientation uh, thinking a little bit more about, particularly in this scheme, how the south-facing classrooms could um, face more ideal south. Um, we got lucky in that the overall project was already uh, minimizing its eastern and western exposures, maximizing its northern and southern. We wanted to improve upon that um, by even uh, exploring how we could uh, uh, rotate those classrooms uh, a little bit more. Um, one of the the sort of core concepts was the idea of connecting this quad with a historic walled garden that you'll see in some of the photos in a moment. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about how much glass, um, both facing north and facing south. Um, and then just the idea of all these breakout common spaces throughout uh, what eventually became, as I said, the collaborative corridor concept. And this was the schematic design uh, that we uh, landed on. Um, still kept a, a good deal of glass facing north, 
um, for that transparency between the two program elements, um, carved out these little pockets. That was a, a byproduct of, of uh, the ideal orientation for these classrooms. We had um, these great little nooks that were distributed along the classroom corridor. Uh, this is the, the North View, uh, uh, a more solid uh, facade and also a more traditional facade facing uh, the historic campus. This is the South facade, a much more contemporary. We were able to use a lot more glass uh, and you can start to see some of the sun shading uh, devices as well. And then this is a, a section taken through what came to be known as the STEM galley, that transparent uh, center part of, of the building um, that, that you know, provided programmatic links between the quad and the, uh, the historic garden, um, but also allowed us to start to explore uh, concepts of daylighting, natural ventilation, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and uh, you know, importantly, the idea of a, a, a flexible program. So one of the things that we were able to do was shrink down the building square footage uh, that helped us from a budget standpoint construction costs, but it also obviously helps um, with the heating and cooling of the building over time. So one of the first things that, that we like to encourage is the idea of, of right-sizing the building. And um, we also like to present what we see um, sort of intuitively and from our experience, um, what are the um, potential green strategies for, for a project in our region uh, the ones in blue are the ones that, that we're going to talk about a little bit more today because they have to do with the bioclimatic design. Um, and then from a system standpoint, Brad. Yeah, so the um, I think on the um, David mentioned earlier <laughs> that we like to have the architects do the work so we don't have to. That's kind of true um, because it really does make a difference how the building performs. And when you start talking about resiliency and bioclimatic design, if you think about the less work the mechanical systems have to do, the more likely we're going to have people comfortable without those systems or with a more extreme climate. So that really is something that um, we feel is really important. I sometimes say the most important component of the HVAC system is the building itself. So I think that really comes into play in the topics here. We did look at several different options for um, building systems using a chiller and a boiler, uh, which is you know, middle of the road in terms of first cost, geothermal, which is higher first cost by a lot, but lower operating cost, and then split systems, which would be lowest first cost and higher operating cost. Sometimes that's what you get if people are focused on just the first cost issues. And we also um, had the opportunity in this building, and we like to find it in many buildings if possible, to use some of the passive strategies for natural ventilation. There are some challenges, and as we noted in the climate zone we're in, we have a mixed environment. So we have hot, humid days, and we also have cold days. And then we have some days in the middle where it's nice to get that natural ventilation. Um, but we really have to deal with all the extremes. So you can't just have an open, airy building. You really have to have um, the full range of performance. And you know, we also looked at some plumbing issues and some electrical, but that's not the the focus for today. And, you know, as Brad said, um, the, the, the work that, that we do as a team before Brad gets involved, right sizing the program, different passive strategies such as sun shading, uh, natural ventilation, but then obviously looking at the, the envelope of the building and uh, having the highest performing building that we can uh, within the budget um, constraints that we have. And so we, we did look at, um, as I mentioned, the way the systems would be uh, configured. It was lucky to have those attic spaces. So that was a nice spot for the air handling equipment. Um, but this illustrates how the geothermal system might be um, implemented if we did go that route. And then the next one I think shows the chiller boiler arrangement. So we have an outdoor chiller. One of the advantages of geothermal, you wouldn't see the equipment. So that was um, something that was appealing. Um, in this case, we could put the boilers up in the attic mechanical room as well. So that was relatively concealed. And then the, as a base comparison, we looked at the typical split systems where we'd have outdoor condensing units um, feeding those same air handlers. So inside the building, the air distribution would be very similar. 
I think it's important to note that one of the um, factors about understanding the climate is also understanding how the users are likely to use the building. So in this case, we have laboratories um, and we're gonna bring in that uh, high volume of outside air in order to ventilate the laboratories according to code and what's needed and to be proper. So that's going to drive a lot of the um, energy conversation because we just have to deal with that fresh ventilation air. So we, we did an um, energy modeling, looked at the distribution of where those loads are. And that is a, often a good starting point um, when you start looking at how the building operates, how the actual occupancy uh, impacts it. And certainly the best thing we can do is have systems turned off when they're not needed, um, but then have those systems respond to whatever varying loads there may be in the building. Um, and in, as I mentioned, in this case, the ventilation was one of the big drivers. And then also trying to take advantage of a, that natural light and have a system that does that in an intelligent way um, could reduce a lot of our lighting energy. So we looked at it on a life cycle basis, compared the um, first cost of the equipment, the operating cost of the equipment. And as you can see in the um, 20 year life cycle cost, that was the time frame that this particular client was interested in. And is a good match with the approximate life cycle of the mechanical systems themselves. Um, the geothermal system with ground coupled heat pumps really has the uh, a higher first cost and a operating cost that is not so dramatically lower because the building was energy efficient, right? So it would be more dramatic if we had a more wasteful structure or more wasteful systems. In the end, they chose to do um, the chiller boiler system. That is the basis of design and that's what we move forward with. And then <clears throat> I think this is uh, an interesting comparison to the Pikes Peak because we did have this zone at what's labeled here as air handler system two. The gray area is the corridors and the entry lobby. And that's more of a transient zone. People are moving around. The activity level is different than it would be, let's say in the math classroom or the faculty offices. And then the magenta color is all the laboratories where again, there's a different sort of experience. So having this zone in a way that each area could have its own set point, its own occupancy schedule, allows it to be very responsive to the um, functions in the building and allows different ranges of temperatures um, where it can float more in that middle zone. So as, as Brad said, the, the labs uh, facing south are on one system. We have uh, uh, math classrooms on the, on the north east that are part of another system additional uh, classrooms and um, faculty office on the second floor uh, as part of this zone and then this central area as the fourth zone. And those um, systems stack through the building. And then uh, th this is a, a, a very loose diagram of um, the idea of how the STEM gallery uh, can function uh, as a naturally ventilated space on the days um, when the outdoor temperature allows that. We do have, uh, this, this is a manually operated system. Um, we do have a light system in the lobby uh, that, that uh, notifies the building occupants when it is a good day to use natural ventilation uh, in, the, in the common areas uh, and, and that lights up. Um, Brad, do you wanna talk about the gravity vent? Yeah, so we know that if we had more of a chimney, um, a taller structure, we could induce more airflow, um, but really aesthetically that wasn't going to work for the campus. And as David said, this is kind of an anchor of the quad, a very traditional um, look to the facilities. So it's a low profile gravity vent, but when the vent is open, um, the natural buoyancy of the air in that central atrium brings that warm air out through the vent and will induce airflow in through doors or windows um, and one of the nice features is that um, corridor space, which is kind of active, but that links us to all the other classrooms. So you can get effective in, um, airflow really from many spaces. And there was a lot of discussion about does a manual system work? Can it be um, done in a manual way? It, and I think the uh, answer is maybe. <laughs> the, you could automate it, but then there's a bunch of things that would break or need maintenance. and um, 
it's kind of transparent to the occupants. So I think that's another thing about bioclimatic design is having occupants engaged with what's going on in the building. Somebody needs to be in charge um, here because the faculty are in the building. That's where their offices are. Um, you know, we couldn't imagine every student getting to make this choice, but the individual teachers for their classroom and the teachers together for the whole building really can make it operate well. And then just to wrap up, these are some in progress professional uh, photos. We haven't had the final ones done. Uh, this is the STEM gallery uh, looking both north to the, uh, the traditional campus and then south out to the garden. You can see here that we did use um, fritting on the large expanses of glass, um, south facing to cut down on the heat gain, north facing um, more for glare, uh, but in both cases to hopefully discourage some um, bird strikes. We did uh, leave that fritting out in sort of key areas. This is, uh, this is looking out into the garden at the first floor upon um, entry. And then this is a shot of, of one of those collaborative corridors um, with uh, the common breakout space technology, whiteboards. And you can just start to see some of the transparency that we created throughout the building um, between the, these corridor spaces and each of the classrooms. Uh, this is a typical classroom. This one happens to be on the first floor looking out to the, the garden and amphitheater. Uh, this is a math classroom, uh, the smaller north-facing um, glazing uh, we left clear, but on the east and west facades, we fritted those because of their exposure. Uh, and then this is just a, a small sample of um, the south-facing classrooms with the sunshades, uh, more contemporary part of the building. And then this is looking back at the north facade, picking up on some of the more traditional forms of the, the gable roofs, um, stucco and uh, stone. So uh, that wraps up our presentation. We went back to these um, renderings because they actually show people in the space. And uh, we wanna you know, hit home the idea that, that this, the reason why we're doing all these things, the reason why we build buildings, the reason why um, we heat and cool them um, is to support the comfort of the occupants of the building, um, regardless of uh, the program. So thank you everyone. Awesome, thank you, um, David and Brad. Um, we do have a bunch of questions that came in. So um, while we have you, we kind of wanted to answer questions and then we'll do some quick takeaways and um, towards the end. So um, the first question that came in was actually from David Hincher um, for Pete to ask about the living building challenge and um, uh, it's intriguing but not surprising that water and wastewater systems require challenging local codes. What other codes or occupant behavior challenges did you encounter? Yeah, the uh, and I think this this first one actually may tie into the second one. So uh, Daniel sent one over that I think was probably intended for for everybody, and so I may just follow up by reading that one out loud. Uh, one of the other occupant behavior factors that played a huge role in the design was the, the cooking program in the facility. If anybody's been to the summit, um, what it's really famous for is the, <laughs> the highest donut in uh, North America. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and it makes me cringe a little bit to see there's some recent news articles about how this whole uh, building was built around a donut machine. That is a journalistic exaggeration. It just meant that they left an opening in the wall to get this donut machine in. But uh, the existing food program is, is really substantial. And there's a concessionaire that has a contract to run that, run that food program. So it's actually not one of the big five user groups. And um, frankly, we got off to a rocky start on it. Um, the, the original food program for the new facility came out, and this was after we had already talked about living building challenge. And I think we had 200 lineal feet of cooking uh, that would require a type one hood in this. And I, it, my jaw, it, Brad's jaw just kind of dropped there too, because he knows what that means. So we, we did some quick assessment on it. And I think what we figured out was about 10% uh, of the floor area would be responsible for over 50% of the energy use on the facility. It was something like 7,000 CFM 
of outside air. And keep in mind, we could be pulling in outside air at sub-zero temperatures pretty pretty regularly that we have to condition, even with energy recovery um, in it. We still have a heck of a lot of heating to do there. So this is where we kind of came back and we said, you're asking for 7,000, our energy model, uh, we can give you 1,200 CFM of exhaust air. And we worked through that with them and was actually um, pretty surprised that what they ended up with was 400 CFM. So we went from sort of just 7,000 CFM if we'd not intervened at all to 400 CFM, which is a dramatic savings. And I didn't get to it today, but it's actually more impactful than anything we did with the envelope or systems and, and you know, it's just kind of crazy. But, uh, you know, we saw some, some scope creep in that area though with that food program. It's something that I've definitely gotten out over my skis on being a mechanical engineer, going toe to toe with the, the concessionaire folks about their food program. We've been trying to get them to think more Panera Bread, less Burger King. They, you know, keep telling us we've tried selling salads in the past and people choose burgers. I'm like, well, when you put a burger right next to a salad and half your, your tourists are from Texas, what do you think they're gonna pick? So, so there's a, a little bit of risk aversion from the concessionaire standpoint. And you know, I think we've seen a little bit of that sneak back into the food program, but uh, overall trying to, to, to challenge that from the get-go has been a real, real kind of struggle um, dealing with the, the, the occupant side of things. So, I, uh, Junkie, the, the other question, though, that um, I referenced came from Daniel. He said, uh, maybe I missed it, but could you explain in a bit more detail what properties slash qualities of the lichen and marmots inspired and applied to the project? Oh. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the, the lichen, and this was something that I, I learned it just in researching the project early on. It's actually a symbiotic relationship, lichen is, between algae and fungus. Um, so it's two organisms kind of coming together there for mutual benefit of each other, um, especially with regards to like photosynthesis and nutrient sharing. And it was driving me nuts. We were trying to figure out some way that we could, we could leverage that within the building. Um, I went down all kinds of rabbit holes looking at things like that food program that I just referenced. Is there a way to um, have this human symbiosis with energy where um, the, the waste and even maybe the composting systems, going through biodigesters, creating fuel that could be used for energy out of that. Um, in the end, what we found is the scale just wasn't significant enough. So, so really the, the biomimetic response to lichen does come from the form. It's looking at the ways that lichen grows in different environments. Um, in that environment in particular, the lichen is usually kind of tucked away uh, in the, the nooks and crannies of rocks. Um, and while it might sound like common sense, to not have things stick up vertically on the summit there, it's really compelling when you show nature's examples and you say, look, anything that grows vertically gets stripped right off the summit there. So let's not build a building that way. Um, so that was the lichen example. The marmot example, um, what I would say one from sort of an insulation standpoint, you look at the marmot organism and its fatty layer on the outside. And I think there's some natural analogies to, to an envelope but also the respiratory systems. And I think we created, um, we weren't looking for an exception for an exception's sake, but uh, I've heard from the ILFI folks that we may have created their, their, their most, uh, their favorite exception request, which was to not do operable windows on the summit. And I used the marmot as an, uh, a biomimetic analogy there because you look at warm blooded mammals in Arctic environments and the respiratory systems are really about conserving and not uh, bringing in a bunch of outside air there. And so we were able to make some analogies to not opening up windows. And we don't want to open up the windows there because every single day that a window opens up, I don't care how warm it is on the summit, it's max temperatures, we need that heat at night. So we want that building hunkered down. We did a bunch of analysis that balances the, uh, the heat that is gained during the day and the mass of that building to basically be a big thermal sponge that releases it at night. So even if it's 75 degrees in the day, it's below freezing at night and we want that heat back there. So we didn't want to waste it with uh, windows that get, get left open there. So a couple examples. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. So it's a really good example of understanding your climate and not necessarily 
um, when you look at uh, standard or rule of thumb, we want to naturally ventilate a building or not. In climate, really dictates which one you're going to choose. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have here is um, a question um, from Molly. Uh, uh, she's asking where to find recent weather data files. Um, so uh, she's mentioned MeteoNorm, which is something that I've actually not used, where um, specifically having the last 15 years. But do you have any recommended source for measured weather data for the last 15 years, a TMY15? And what are your thoughts on using synthetic versus measured weather data in annual energy use analysis? Um, Molly, I might have a question for you before we try to answer it. What do you mean by synthetic versus measured? Hi, this is Molly. So my understanding of the media norm files is that they're not constructed from weather station or they're, they're constructed from weather station data but meshed together in a synthetic way so like triangulated from different weather data stations um, okay. and I guess what I'm looking for is a source that gives you a TMI 15 file but that is from a specific weather station so it's, it's real measured weather data. Yeah, so um, there's climate1building.org that has just recently updated in 2020 uh, their data sets. Um, that's the most current uh, weather set that I know of that comes from weather data files, like actual weather stations at airports. Um, but they're not TMY15 files. They're just like TMYX, the most current. Sorry, not TMYX, just the most current um, weather files formats for that. Have you sure. used? Yeah. What's, do you know what the date range is on those files? Yeah, they go up until 2018. Okay, so it just uses, it. it's not necessarily the last 15 years, but it may be a longer time period. Oh, like, yeah, it's um, actually, if you, leave your, um, if you sent me a direct message, I can send you a link to it or actually copy it in here. Okay. Um, and you can read about it where climate dealt one. Yeah, I'll add it in there. Thank you. All right, so while I do that, and then um, there is, there are one more question for Notre Dame project. Did you discover other passive strategies such as natural ventilation could be leveraged in zones with lower energy use? Oh, sorry, with lower energy usage. And did you encounter any resistance with occupant behavior to be more adaptive? I would, I can answer a little bit of that. So the, um, the idea that there was affecting the energy is definitely something that we believed, but we didn't do a detailed analysis to show that. Um, so we don't have data to say this is how much energy is saved. And it depends so much on the occupant behaviors of manually opening the windows and taking advantage of the natural ventilation when it's uh, appropriate. Um, that is very hard to model that and then have that match the reality. And so far, we don't have any data back from uh, the project and the actual performance uh, to understand that. Adding to the challenge, the building, um, or really the facilities maintenance director, who helped us and worked with us through the project has now moved on to another school. So there's new people that kind of have to get used to how this building operates too. Follow up on that, Brad, because I asked the question, is, um, is there anything on sort of the educational intervention side with either static or dynamic uh, prompts to the occupants to encourage that behavior? Yeah, in, in the lobby, there is a dynamic prompt with the light system. So green light, go ahead and open the windows, red light, keep your windows closed. And that's automated from the building automation system that essentially says the weather conditions are appropriate. We would normally go in an economizer mode and ventilate um, without heating or cooling. And when that's the case, that's a good time for someone to open the windows. And the, and the vent would already have been open. So it's kind of the the air path out is already established and they just need to open the windows. And, and one more follow-up to that. Do you guys have a relationship with them for getting post-occupancy data? 
on actual energy usage to see if I, there's actually an impact. Yeah, I wish we did, but we don't. Right. I mean, the only piece that we do have is they have committed to the the lead reporting. Um, so uh, that might be one component. Um, but as Brad said, there's also a, a new facilities person, uh, like brand new in the last two months. So we haven't yet um, developed a relationship with him, um, but he has been um, involved in the final certification process. So it's something that he's interested in doing. So Brad, that is something we consider. Awesome. Um, I Apologies, uh, Molly, I didn't answer the second part of your question. So I just wanted to toggle back here for a minute and um, thoughts on using synthetic versus uh, measured weather data in annual energy analysis. I really think there are a lot of sources that are out there um, and it, it really comes down to doing something project specific. Um, I think for P and the example that was given for Pikes Peak, it was kind of a necessity, um, but you can actually get um, weather station data from personal weather stations around the country. Um, people who are posting their weather, like they're, they're syncing their weather station to um, weather underground. Uh, I've tried to create my own EPW weather files from um, that weather, like actual weather stations. And it really impacts like wind speed and you can get a really good understanding of urban heat island effect. Cause I, I feel like I've used a um, weather station at Penn um, and then compared it to the weather station at the Philadelphia airport. And you can see a slight um, uptick in temperature around Europe. And you can see, like you can attribute that to the heat island effect and how um, the built up area around Penn is very different than the airport data that you might get from the weather station at the airport. And so it is time, um, it is a time sink to kind of do your own weather file as Pete can probably attest to. So it, I feel like that's something that you would probably decide to do on a project that um, warrants it. And it, yeah. Okay. All right. So I hope that, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad I was able to capture that. Um, are there any other questions before we switch back to our takeaways for the session today and feel free to unmute uh, yourself or unmute yourself oops where's the presentation disappeared can you guys see the presentation we yeah, can we see your screen oh there you go it just was behind my all right so um josh do you want to actually do take the takeaways on Sure, sure. I mean, I think really just kind of talking about some of the things we've uh, we focused on uh, in this talk. Obviously, uh, at the beginning, there were no mechanical systems, and you know, build, buildings uh, inherently were adapted to their regional climatic conditions. And uh, I think bioclimatic design. I'm not sure when the term was coined. We probably should have figured that out, but uh, um, it's uh, you know, it, it's kind of what we call it now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Victor Oldjai in the 1950s in Design with Climate. Actually, that's a very good point. You wrote that book, didn't you? <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that was actually right there. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jack. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um, so, and then also, you know, whether, you know, I think we, we talked about, um, you know, all, all of the kind of really emerging and, um, you know, more sophisticated uh, data and stimulation tools. Uh, that are available, um, and we also talked about, um, you know, how you know these techniques, you know, you know, through the these, the passive strategies, the climate appropriate strategies, they they all kind of work hand in hand, and um, you know, and, and you know have, have proven over time to be effective, you know, proved proven out to be effective, and then I think you know really one of the one of the you know interesting things too to really think about both in the context of our 2030 commitment and you know, the, the climate change that we're trying to mitigate is that we really do have to identify climate data sets that are going to be representative of the, uh, the life cycle of our project. And I, and I think 
um, you know, that's honestly a point that I, that I hadn't really considered uh, uh, so much before we uh, started um, discussing uh, the, the, the topics and what we wanted to talk about today. Jackie, I don't know if you have anything you want to add uh, as well, but... Uh... No, I'm good. I was just um, writing a thank you message to everyone in the chat box. Um, we really appreciate you guys joining us, especially to our presenters, Pete, Brad, and David. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us and um, uh, teaching us a little bit or adding to the bioclimactic design conversation. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>